Uh, do grab a seat if you can. Uh, well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, what an amazing day. Some absolutely brilliant papers from lots of people covering a, a huge range of issues. Thank you to everyone on that. Uh, and it wouldn't have been... I hear we had some floods or minor leaks, at least, in some of the rooms. It wouldn't be an academic conference with some sort of infrastructure <laughs> failure. So that was good to see as well. So we're, we're on to our final session before we have our drinks uh, reception and what a treat it is to have as a final session because we're going to have a keynote presentation from Professor Pippa Norris who's the Paul F. Maguire Lecturer in Comparative Politics at Harvard University and Vice President of the World Values Association and I won't go into Pippa's long hugely impressive CV but she is obviously one of the most cited political scientists uh, in the world uh, and has so many major honours and uh, 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 honorary doctorates and everything else, as well as incredible books that have helped us understand what's really changing. Just plugging the upcoming one, The Cultural Roots of Democratic Backsliding, I think is, is out soon. So, no further ado, over to Pippa. Thank you so much, Bobby. It's a pleasure to be with you all, if not in person, at least virtually. Uh, I apologise, I can't be with her because the conference papers look brilliant in terms of things like identity politics, religion and politics, values uh, and parties and polarisation, and there's so much that could be done. I'm going to focus today, however, on some recent work I've been doing, which is on party system polarisation, and it's about when things fall apart, to quote um, Yates, and polarisation in Western democracies. There's so much concern about this in the United States, the big question, is this a phenomena across Western democracies or is this something which is again an example of American exceptionalism? And so I'm going to talk about the theory and the concepts, the measures, the evidence and the data I'll use, which won't actually derive that much from mass level in this particular paper, but are really about uh, how party system positions change over time. I look at the trends in party fragmentation across Western democracies and we need a long-term perspective to understand this. And so I'm going back to the 1960s, 70 years worth of data, and then party system polarization in terms of ideology and values and the conclusions. And this is obviously a topic which is the topic of the year in terms of American publications. These are just some of the books which have come out recently by excellent scholars, whether we're talking about uh, political choice and how elites have polarized and impact impacted their publics, whether we're talking about uh, moral values and how people feel that this is related to religion, why democracies are divided, American gridlock, and so on. Excellent work, but very much focused primarily on the United States case. And because it's been so influential, this has obviously stimulated work in many other countries as well, but I think that is still developing in a systematic way. And the concepts that we're using here and polarization, obviously, through the conference papers can mean different things. But in this sense, it's about party systems in this particular study. And so going back to the classic work of Giovanni Sartori of 1976, the degree of ideological distance among political parties, both in the legislature and in the electorate within any polity. So it might depend on different types of issues, for example, issues about social conservatism, Classic cases right now in America are things like abortion politics and reproductive rights, or it might be issues about the economy, differences between values of those preferring state intervention versus markets, or any other broader uh, abstract notion such as left and right. And clearly in the classic work, central beetle party systems converge and the argument is in the moderate middle, they have to compete for the median voter, but particularly in majoritarian systems, but of course, that raises the big question in America, how come, in particular right now, the GOP is not aiming to go for the independence for the suburban mums in the cliche, because we seem to have developed a more centrifugal party system, much more widely dispersed across issues and values, and in particular, appealing strongly to distinct voting bases rather than competing by trying to get the same pool of voters. And of course, the argument is that if, if parties do that, there are problems, they can get elected in particular districts, but they may have difficulties in achieving executive positions, the largest party in parliament, or presidential elections. And parties move, but if they go too far right or too far left, 
the argument is that they'll lose out if the distribution of public preferences is in a normal curve. So what are the potential consequences? Why are we so concerned about it in this conference and in the American literature? Because of the consequences which are thought to ha ha be, be flow from lack of either minimal polarization, in other words, a convergence which is too narrow, or particularly extreme polarization, where there's tremendous differences in values and norms and beliefs. And it has important consequences potentially in the literature for stable government. One can think about extremists who come into power, but then whether or not their policies can continue and be effective. For example, uh, too much polarization can be really problematic for economic management. It can be problematic for governing coalitions. Think about the difficulties, for example, in the Netherlands in terms of the elections, trying to bring all parties into an effective uh, form of government. Problems of legislative bargaining, in particular in Congress right now, coalition building, almost impossible. Think about the ways in which the United States has had problems in even passing its budget. And we've had short term solutions, but it's no way to run an economy to promote long term stability. But polarization can matter for the electoral choices. And again, if there are too few choices, that's a problem. For example, if it's a predominant party system and there's one major party, as in Russia, or if there's too many parties, and then you get many more choices, but also more complexities of voting. It can matter at the mass level, as the conference has, uh, has worked on, in participation and activism and civic engagement. And the focus following Ayenga on negative partisanship, how people vote because they dislike the other side, not because they like their own side. For voting turnout, where polarization can be positive and negative, it can make people angry and engaged, or it can make people so apathetic that they stay, stay home. For protest politics and feelings of trust, and most problematically for the propensity to political violence. If the party system is so extreme, people are in us then camps and they no longer recognize the legitimacy of other parties, of opponents and of the political system. And it can lead to processes of both democratic and authoritarian advance and retreat. Those are the claims. And concern about American polarization has been around for many, many years. It's nothing new. But in particular, after the events of January the 6th, after the events of the election of Donald Trump in 2016, and before that, the election of Obama, which also heightened some racial animosities, we see concern has broadened. And so you can't pick up a paper, you can't pick up uh, a news item, or nowadays articles and books as well. And it's thought that if there's so much polarization that politicians no longer can achieve a bargaining and legislative compromise. They can't pass budgets. They can't uh, uh, basically address major policy problems like gun control. They are uh, divided over basic issues of democracy. Then in particular, democracy can have problems. And if we're all in an us versus them oppositional mindset and our political identities are tied up with our social identities, then this can have all sorts of ills for American politics. And we're going to have to see what happens in the 2024 election as to whether or not there is any sort of compromise depending on the outcome. But in a tight election with high levels of polarization and mistrust in the process, everybody fears that the outcome could well have even further setbacks for the problems of American democracy. So, Here's some of the examples of why there's a problem in America. And when we look at partisan antipathy or animosity, for example, those who believe that either their own party and the other party compared with other Americans are more close minded, has gone up, according to Pew data, are more dishonest, are unintelligent, are lazy. All of these problems, as you can see from the election of Donald Trump in 2016 through to the most recent Pew survey, the number of those who feel antipathy against their opponents has really risen sharply. And it can have an impact on democracy. This is a complicated model, but it basically is just a heuristic model to try to understand democratic backsliding. And it's from my new book, which um, Bobby mentioned. And you can see at the heart of it, we have party polarization over policy values, but above all over democracy. If 
parties and party representatives can no longer agree, for example, about the integrity of elections, that's a problem for accepting the outcome. And party polarization is thought to lead to the rise of authoritarian populist leaders and changes in liberal democracy, how institutions work, and to be caused by and triggered by, as our previous work has suggested, changes in democratic and authoritarian social cultures, along with economic and social inequality and deepening social cleavages and ethnic diversity. So what matters are the institutions, how that leads to certain forms of agency and how mass society, I'm arguing in my new book, is actually driving these sorts of changes. Now, let's think about, in particular, what we're talking about in terms of our key questions that we can focus on just in a brief talk. So the first question, as I emphasized at the beginning, is polarization another case of American exceptionalism, in particular due to deepening cultural cleavages in a cultural backlash, combined with a two-party system, which exacerbates political disaffection, where the system no longer seems to work on either side, or is it a Western phenomena which many democracies are afflicted by? And clearly polarization over Brexit could be seen as an example. And in cases where polarization is evident, can it be blamed on growing party system fragmentation? So the concepts that we're going to use, party system fragmentation is a standard measure. We've used it in many studies and it's measured by the effective number of political parties in the electorate standing for elections above a certain minimum, such as 3% of, of the vote, and in Parliament, defined again by the number of seats that any party holds. So we're looking for the ENEP or the ENPP in parties in nationwide contests over time. And what the study is looking at is, has there been a rise in party fragmentation on a consistent basis over a long-term period? And of course, this, matter, this measure matters because all sorts of our concepts about party systems from the classics really derive from the number of parties which are there in the electorate or in parliament. For example, the classification, which is there very common about one party or predominant party systems. Many parties can stand for elections, but one party consistently wins time and time again, whether in Singapore, in Hungary, in Turkey, South Africa or Japan. Two party systems which are shrinking in numbers, but nevertheless, where the major parties rotating office and two and a half party systems exemplified by the United States, despite the fact that we have an independent candidate, uh, Kennedy running and in Australia, two and a half party system, moderate part, multi party systems, classically seen as a country like Germany or Sweden, where there are four or five parties, maybe eight in total, which get into the Reichstag or into the Bundestag and which more competes in the electorate, but they don't necessarily succeed because of thresholds. And then extreme multi-party systems exemplified by Israel, the Netherlands, Belgium and Switzerland, where there are multiple cleavages and parties can appeal to different sectors of the electorate. Now, what we want to look at are some testable claims and the arguments about how party system fragmentation relates to polarization has two alternative perspectives. In the debate, on the one hand, we have early work in 2008 by Russ Dalton, who argued that polarization can be independent of the number of parties. And so you could well get a system which is fragmented, but they're all fragmented over single issue protest parties, which are neither classically left or right across the political spectrum. And we can think of the growth of green parties concerned about, in particular, environmental change and climate change, anti-immigrant parties who can be seen as single issues and who are often and can be more moderate on, for example, the welfare state and, and economic issues, anti-EU parties, regional nationalistic parties, for example, in Catalan or in Barcelona, potentially in Scotland, agrarian parties who are still uh, organised in rural areas with particular interests, personalistic parties, particularly in emerging party systems, pirate parties in Europe and populists, and all sorts of combinations of these as well. So Dalton says that we can't measure party polarization by measures of party fractionalization. On the other hand, work by Batoa, for example, published more recently, 
says that growing party fragmentation is actually systematically linked with partisan polarization. And the center cannot hold because there's been a decline of social democracies and socialist parties in the moderate center. There's been a decline of Christian Democrats and uh, traditional right-wing uh, economic conservatives and the proliferation of anti-establishment parties, as he calls them. New parties on both the progressive left and particularly the authoritarian, social conservative or radical right, depending on the label which is being used. So let's go on to our measures. What's the relationship between fractionalization and polarization? Fractionalization is easy to measure from all of our national election results. And I'm using the comparative political data set, which is a useful resource because it does have long term data. And I compare 36 liberal democracies, which are very varied. And it's fairly straightforward to count reliably from official records, depending upon decisions for a particular cutoff point and how we count party coalitions. Now, party polarization is much more complex to measure. And in particular, when we're trying to measure it unidimensionally, in other words, on a simple left right spectrum, we can certainly do so by some summary measures. But if parties are competing on different types of issues, and if there is now multidimensional ideological positions, it becomes more complex to come at reliable and consistent estimates, particularly on a long term basis. So we can use experts and we can look at party ideology and issue positions and obviously chairs, the party from the 1970s. Or we can look at things like the Manifesto project, particularly in Europe over, over a longer period. But all of these measure slightly different things in many ways. For example, the Manifesto Project is great. Very little, in fact, on attitudes and values of parties and positions towards democracy, if that was assumed. Roll call voting records are another measure, but that's difficult to generalize across, across nationally. Very good for Congress, less so for across a wide range of different democracies over time. We can have mass perceptions of party positions. For example, CSES asks where do parties uh, position themselves on the left-right basis. But again, that can be problematic if we have more complex issues and, and parties are not simply uh, going across a single spectrum. And then what we can also do is look at ideological values and issue positions of voters in the electorate. Um, and again, that's an incredibly valuable resource. And the world values obviously goes back to 1981 in a limited number of societies, but we can use that to try to document polarization over issues by looking, for example, at the standard deviation on many of the standard um, uh, scales that we've used in the World Value Survey. Now, I'm gonna focus in particular in this measure, in this study on the Global Party Survey, which I organized, because this gives us multidimensional ideological values and issue positions worldwide. And I'm going to select the economic left-right spectrum as a classic one, cultural liberalism and conservatism on social values, and then also just look at a few issues and authoritarian and democ democratic principles. And polarization I'm measuring by the standard deviation of the mean party position on these scales in each country. Let's look at the results. Well, first, fragmentation. What's changed? Well, it'll be absolutely no surprise to the audience at this meeting, and indeed to any scholars of political science who, and party systems, to know that, of course, there has been growing fragmentation over the last 70 years, but to emphasize the degree of fragmentation varies from one place to another. And it's also not as great as some of the studies might assume or is commonly discussed in the media. So here's the effective number of electoral parties, that's to say, um, effective number in the electorate, in election results in the 1960s, and then again um, in 2010 to 2020, and the estimate of the change. So the change is what we want to focus on in a wide varieties of democracies, not just in Europe, but across different societies. And then we can also look at the effective number of parliamentary parties and the change. What's the summary? Quite simply, the effective number of electoral parties in the electorate, 3.5, but clearly some countries have a classic two-party system like the USA and the United Kingdom. Others were already in moderate party competition, and you can see cases like Finland or France, uh, particularly before the de Gaulle uh, changes in the constitution there. 
changes uh, which we can see, fragmentation in the Netherlands. And what changes over time? Well, as we can again see, essentially overall, the number of parties goes up from 3.5 to 5.1. On average, parties in the electorate over that seven decades. And again, if you look at the change indicators, some party systems have changed a lot. And of course, some have changed minimally, in particular in the United States. There have been occasional third party candidates. Ross Perot did very well. And we're going to see how Kennedy does in 2024. But by and large, predominance of two parties is watertight for a variety of structural reasons. Despite changes in the electorate, despite changes in society, Democrats and Republicans are the only gain in town. In Parliament, i.e. in the legislature, we can see a smaller degree of increased, but nevertheless some increase. An average 3.1 parties get into Parliament in the 1960s and uh, in the last decade about four. And of course the reason is electoral thresholds, voting thresholds, along with a variety of other assets which the major parties have and institutional rules which um, will uh, effectively make it very difficult for third parties and minor parties in general to make breakthroughs, particularly through the electoral system, if it's majoritarian or plurality. So there is increased party fragmentation, as you might assume. This is how it varies across different countries. And we can see over time that the varieties are quite remarkable. So look at Belgium, which is here. And we can see a steady rise. And that, of course, can be attributed by all Belgian scholars to the rise of um, uh, regional polarization between, uh, between um, Francophone and Wallonia. And we can see the differences have risen sharply, 10 parties on average in the most recent periods. In some other countries, we see different patterns. If you look, for example, at Poland, tremendous fragmentation in the very first free and fair open elections, but then it stabilizes. And so after the system, after the first founding elections, the uh, number of parties goes down. And we can see some countries, again, this is uh, the, the clearest example are the United Kingdom and the United States, which are flat, where there's no change in the ENPP over time, despite changes in society, despite changes in the culture, despite a, a thousand and one other factors. And if we go to the pattern in terms of the uh, electorate, Again, we see, for example, if I focus on the United Kingdom, a slight rise, and that, of course, is the rise of the Liberal Dems and the SNP, like Cambrou, and other changes in the party system, getting representation and getting votes. But, of course, again, a very slow rise compared with, say, a Belgium or uh, some other regions which have gone through much greater instability or gradual rises. Gradual rises are exemplified, I think, best in many Scandinavian countries. And you can see that in Norway or Denmark or Finland. So fragmentation has increased. What about polarization? Well, polarization, as I mentioned, is about ideology. And here what we have are the changes. And the way that we map it in our book, Cultural Backlash, is multidimensional on two dimensions. One is the left right, which people uh, continue to be divided on and which parties continue to be divided on between state and markets. And the other is a set of values which can be seen as liberal or conservative on social values, attitudes towards gender equality, attitudes towards sexual identity, towards reproductive rights, towards LGBTQ, towards climate change, towards nationalism versus uh, internationalism. How do parties vary on this? Well, this shows my measure from the global party, no, I apologize, from the global party survey broken down by country. And what we've got is going across the bottom, the axis, which is about parties, which experts placed on the left or the right in terms of, uh, of their positions towards the state versus markets by and large, taxation, redistribution. And then on the vertical axis is between uh, the, the cultural issues of liberal or conservative. And you can see that in many Western democracies, there is a diagonal line so that the parties who see themselves on the right on the economy also tend to be conservative. 
And I've also illustrated here the size of the parties. You might expect that major parties, for example, illustrated in red with a high share of the vote and seats are in the center of the political spectrum. And what we can see is the distribution across different, um, different party systems. So again, I'm just going to focus on a couple of cases to illustrate this. Switzerland, in the bottom right corner, classically many parties, and they're uniformly distributed. So the electorate gets a choice across all the different values from the parties which are very conservative, for example, on immigration and on attitudes towards religion and on keeping Swiss borders tight, towards those who are much more liberal and much more concerned about green issues, gender equality. And we can see a similar distribution in many countries across the spectrum. But I will highlight just one case here, which is really important, and that's the United States. And there what you can see is that the two parties are indeed polarized in the same direction as many of the other countries. But of course, there are no other parties in the center of the political spectrum. And what's important also to emphasize is that the Democrats are broadly speaking much in line with the Labour, Social Democratic and Socialist parties in other countries. In other words, they're moderately towards the centre, but still on the left and liberal. But the GOP, the Republican Party, has gone far up to the right. So it's up there right now with many of the parties um, uh, which we now uh, recognise as authoritarian populist in some terminologies, radical right, far right, like Vox, for example, like um, uh, the PVV in the Netherlands, like AFD in Germany, uh, etc. So polarization in some ways is more problematic in the United States, partly because your choices at the ballot box are limited, but the parties, particularly the Republican Party, has moved dramatically towards the conservative right. This gives you another take of it, which gives you a little bit more information and brings in the issue of populism. So it's the same um, mapping in terms of how you can look at left right and liberal conservative. And you can see in the top right hand corner that I've also added the level of populism. Um, and again, you can look online the um, global party survey to look at how to find all of these measures. It's defined in the bottom, but just briefly, you can see that many of the most populous parties, which are in red, including Likud, the Republicans, the Swiss People's Party and Vox are all very much in that area. But there are a couple of more populist parties which are in liberal democracies, which can be seen elsewhere, particularly, for example, in Norway and in Denmark, where parties are more towards the left on welfare and economic issues, but still um, conservative in their social values. And this is a summary showing you the overall degree of, of uh, party system polarization by looking at the standard deviation around the mean of party positions on these two scales. And again, the United States is remarkable because it's really the highest in party system polarization. Next comes Switzerland, Sweden more recently, Denmark, the United Kingdom is up there. And then the least polarized Canada, despite some, uh, some issues there which are changing in recent years, um, Finland, Ireland, again, with some interesting developments most recently. So party polarization by country does vary. And the United States does seem exceptional. Now, the last thing I'm going to mention and turn over because I'm running out, totally run out of time, I believe, is just what happens when we put these two things together, party fractionalization and party polarization. Does one predict the other? And the simple answer, as Russ Dalton found uh, more than a decade ago now, is there's very little relationship between these two measures. What does that mean? If you look at some of these patterns, for example, we can look at the ENEP, the number of parties in the electorate in the first column, and whether or not that predicts their position on social values, economic values, on a wide variety of different issues, such as women's rights, such as immigration, such as nationalism. The only significant relationship there is on positions towards populist governments, where it is the case that where parties are more populist, there tends to be a higher fragmentation. But 
there are many other issues, including on actually attitudes towards democracy and a, a wide range of ideological values. The number of the parties in the electorate cannot be seen as a prediction of polarization. Why? Because when we saw that map, we saw there are many minor parties in the center of the political spectrum who are no longer, um, who, who are still um, uh, represented either in voting or in parliament, but are not necessarily extreme. So that's where basically what happens is that issues are of particular concern and those parties can appeal to their base. Think about a regionalist party in Spain. They can get support, but still be mainstream on many of the core economic or social values or other types of issues which are um, uh, uh, parties compete about. So we cannot use party fractionalization as a measure of polarization. We have to measure polarization separately. Now, in conclusion, what does, uh, what does this say? Party systems, yes, of course, a wealth of evidence has already shown it's hardly surprising to become increasingly fragmented, although again, not as much as some people assume. The case of the Netherlands or Israel are still exceptional, or Belgium. And the number of parties in parliament is restricted by institutional constraints. But above all, what this shows is that fragmentation is not a proxy for party system polarization. Two party systems can be highly polarized, as in the United States, and multi-party systems can be moderately consensual, where there's a broad agreement about key issues, but still parties appeal, for example, to different linguistic groups or different uh, sectors by class or different types of, uh, of other uh, cleavages in the electorate, for example, uh, for the agrarian parties or for parties who are concerned about libertarian uh, and pirate parties or those who are concerned about climate change. So the conclusion, and here's the strongest conclusion of all, which is that the degree of contemporary party polarization in the United States may be exceptional. Now, I can't prove that. We need to have much further research to, to, to actually determine that. But it might not be the case that what happens in the United States is really happening in every other, or even in many other Western democracies. And why might the US be exceptional? And I don't have time, but the simple answer I've argued elsewhere, cultural backlash, very, very strong due to the religious heritage in the United States and the strength of religious fundamentalism. And the cleavages over rural and urban America and constitutional design. It's the way that the cultural divisions have expanded, but the constitution is so rigid that it cannot accommodate a variety of different centrist parties because they cannot succeed and they can't get elected, either in state houses or in, in Senate or in the House, unless there's a major constitutional reform, which seems extremely unlikely, or changes to primary processes or changes to other things which benefit the two major parties. So if you think about it, we really have more pressures on fragmentation because of cultural cleavages, but they can't be accommodated because of the constitutional design. And the last thing is methodological, the last point, we do need better measures of trends over time and a long time in multidimensional forms of ideological and issue polarization in party systems. And unfortunately, our measures aren't really as strong as we'd like. But we can't assume just because a party system is more fractionalized, meaning there are many more parties in the electorate or in parliament, that it's necessarily more polarized. That I think has to be really questioned and so we need to measure polarization more directly. Apologies for going over. I'm going to stop sharing. And I hope that that was uh, useful. And I really look forward to listening to all of the panel and their views, uh, David, Paula, Anand, and, and Bobby, and think through some of these issues and your perspectives on uh, uh, these questions. Coming on stage, uh, Pippa, really masterful presentation, doing that to a blank screen from your point, or a blank stage is the only thing you can see. Uh, Paula, do you want to go there? Oh, yes. Like talking, talking, into, talking into the void, to quote um, Peter Mayer. Cool. Yeah, cool. You, you did it masterfully. Uh, brilliant stuff. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Very good. Hi, Pippa. Great.
So now we're on to panel discussion and Q&A uh, element of this. And we've got what a brilliant panel to round off um, the day. I'll just, introduce, I'll just introduce them all uh, to start with, and then we get five minutes from each, and then we'll have time for questions uh, from you. Um, uh, and first up, actually, we'll have Paula Surrey. Paula is uh, Professor of Political Sociology at the University of Bristol, also Deputy Director of UK and Changing Europe, which I think is fair to say is probably the leading academic think tank in uh, the UK, I would uh, definitely suggest. Uh, then we'll hear from Anand Menot, who is Professor of European Politics and Foreign Affairs here at King's and Director of UK in the Changing Europe. And then finally from David Halpin, who is President and Founding Director of the Babel Insights teams, many other roles in, including the Chief Analyst in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit for a number of years, and also a visiting professor here with us at the Policy Institute at King's, which we're delighted about. But five minutes each from the panel. We're going to start with you, Paul, if that's okay. Thank you, and thank you, Pippa, for such a wide-ranging and interesting presentation. Um, my comments are not necessarily going to be directly on Pippa's presentation, but more the thoughts they sparked, it, thoughts it sparked in me as she was talking um, and as I read the paper on which the presentation was based. So the, I've just got three points. I want to keep it relatively brief because you'd much rather ask questions of Pippa, really. Um, the first thing that struck me when I was looking through the paper was this puzzle that we have around negative partisanship, that we keep seeing it rising. We've, I've, I've heard it talked about quite a quite a lot today across various presentations and really I don't think we understand it why that has been rising at the same time as partisanship falling what function is it performing for the electorate now as a, a way of understanding and organizing their political behavior um, I have thought about it like you know if you're a sometime football fan and you used to have a team that you really supported but now you just want Manchester City to lose all the time. <laughs> how is that working for people in the electorate and how is it changing how people engage with, with their politics? So that was the first puzzle. The second thing that I've talked about endlessly to anybody that will listen is the importance of this multidimensional understanding which, which Pippa put up in her two dimensions and, and showed really, really clearly. Um, I've argued in the past that I think this multidimensionality is particularly strong in the UK and has to some extent um, insulated us from polarisation. And what I was really, really struck by in um, Pippa's charts while she was talking was when you put up those two dimensions, you see very, very few cross-pressured parties but if we were to put up similar charts of the electorate, you see lots and lots and lots of cross-pressured voters. So, but what I mean by that is most of the parties lie on the diagonal line. They're either bottom left quadrant or top right. But when you, when, when you throw the electorate into that space, they don't lie on that neat line. Um, and I think we need to think a lot more about that um, interaction between the voters who don't have comfortable homes and how they try to move around in that space to find it. And obviously they can do that um, more easily in a multi-party system because they do have more choices, even if those choices don't match up as well. Or whether when you, when you come to a system like the US where you've only got two choices, you make a choice and then you have to kind of rationalize it and place yourself in it. And maybe that is what's driving that polarization there, but it insulating systems elsewhere. <clears throat> Um, and the final point that I wanted to make was the importance of those two levels of analysis. So the importance of understanding the party system, which I see a lot of, um, particularly in the comparative politics literature, which is a, a very kind of top-down approach, thinking about where parties position themselves, how parties compete with each other. And then the importance of interacting that with the level of the electorate and thinking through the electorate, which is where the World Value Study, of course, then comes into its own because it offers that rich data for the comparative analysis, not only um, across countries, but also over time. And I think one of the things that, to understand any of this, and, and I'm looking forward to Pippa's new book, because it sounds from some of the charts there that she's going to be touching on these, on these big questions of how really huge societal changes have driven political change. And sometimes I think when we talk about party systems, we get a bit too focused on that narrow lens of party political change and forget that there have been huge changes in social structure and how those two interact is really critical for understanding them. I hope that wasn't right. too long. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. And I was just thinking, 
Skipper, we'll come back to you maybe at the end of all the panel comments for any of your further reflections, and that will give the audience a bit of time to think about questions for themselves. So if we, if we go through all the comments first, uh, Anand. Anand Thanks, thoughts? Bobby. I mean, I sit here as a, as a lapsed political scientist, so what I'm going to do is use Pippa's remarks as a, as a starting point for some more general reflections. I've got four points, and when I said to Paula yesterday I was going to be done in under five minutes, she gave me a sceptical look. So I see this as a sort of dare now that I will be done within my five minutes. I mean, the first point is just to stress what Paula said and what Pippa said, which is politics is so messy now. I mean, I remember being at the, the Conservative Party conference in 2021, where a right wing, in both senses, Prime Minister, was talking about increasing immigration to foster growth and ended up in a massive fight with her right wing, presumably also in both senses, Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, who went out and said, we need to be cutting immigration. I mean, these cross pressures are so obvious. And actually, one of the striking things about politics now is the degree of polarisation you get within parties if you look at the contemporary Conservative Party, let alone uh, between them. And actually, one of the most malign forms of polarisation we've seen in our politics, I think, over the last decade or so, is the impact of party members, particularly when it comes to party leadership campaigns. And it's a form of polarisation that is incredibly important, and I'm not sure we talk about it enough. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, polarisation, of course, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, some of the worst populist backlashes we've seen are a result of a sense that everyone's the same. You go all the way back to Jörg Haider in Austria in the early part of this century to actually the rhetoric of UKIP uh, in 2015. A notion that there's nothing to separate mainstream parties is almost more dangerous in some ways than clear ideological water between them because it prompts anti-system uh, feelings. And of course, as Pippa hinted at, one of the other things about polarisation is it can increase engagement. You look at the US election turnout in 2020 as an example of that. Third thing is, I'm quite interested in what polarisation means for government and for governing. And here I think the link between fragmentation of party systems and polarisation is quite interesting because there is evidence to suggest, I think, that Multi-party systems, PR systems, are better at taming the extremes than two-party systems. If you think about the example of, of the Netherlands at the moment, Wilders can't form a coalition. Uh, if you think about the example of Italy, what happens to Maloney when she goes into government with other parties, she's forced to abandon some of her more extreme positions. If you compare that with a Donald Trump in the United States, uh, one of the issues with a two-party system is that if an extreme, if, ex, if, if polarization occurs within one of the two parties, it's far harder to exercise a break on it because you're not forced to work with partners or to build coalitions. And the final point related to that is one about policy. If you think about the kinds of public policy issues that confront us today, whether it's climate change, aging populations, AI and technology, whatever it may be, the thing that they all have in common is they require medium to long-term solutions. Uh, in multi-party systems, you tend to get longer-term public policies, again, because parties are forced to compromise and to work together. If you look at the UK system, one of the greatest problems that I think is partly at least attributable to polarisation is our complete inability to do anything, even medium-term, let alone long-term. I mean, you know, a party comes in, what's the first thing it does is it promises to overturn what the last party did. And the most egregious example of this, I think, in the last decade is social care. Uh, when the Labour Party put forward some pretty sensible proposals about social care in 2010, the Conservative Party denounced them as a death tax and they were quickly shelved. When Theresa May came up with some fairly similar proposals about social care in 2017, the Labour Party condemned them as a dementia tax and they were, again, quickly shelved. We've reached that stage of the policy cycle now where a political party that thinks it's going to win an election is able, in the form of, Mel of West Streeting, to say, ooh, we'd like to do this on a cross-party basis, knowing full well that when push comes to shove, our system just seems incapable of building those sorts of uh, long-term coalitions. So I think, actually, Pippa's absolutely right that party fragmentation may not in and of itself lead to polarisation, but I think the number of parties in your system has a direct bearing on the impact that polarisation has on governing and on public policy. So in that sense, there is a connection, albeit it might work slightly in the other direction. Look at that, Paula Surridge. Four minutes, 30 seconds. You've only seconds. done three points. <laughs> that was four points. <laughs> A rewrite history. <laughs> well, this is incredible discipline. I've never seen this from a panel such as this. It's uh, very, very good. Thank you very much, Anna. That was great. Dave. 
Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, I'm, I guess, a recovering academic would be my <laughs> category. But I used to work on the World Value Survey, so it's, actually, I just want to say in general, it is wonderful to see the UK back in the World Value Survey oh. Square, to see you all today thinking about these issues, thinking about deeply, like, to see our position in the world, right, um, in a broken way. Um, a few quick thoughts and some questions, really, back to Pippa, too. Um, Pippa, if I might say, it's quite a depressing story. You're, you're giving in a very measured way, but for those who study the US, it does, for those outside, it is striking, distinctive, depressing. Um, and the likes of Bob Putnam, who I work with a lot, you know, he's telling his story about, well, we'll have that great upswing. You know, you've got to grit your teeth and look pretty hard at the US data to see where this new upswing and conversion is coming from. It's even more astonishing, I think, in a historical perspective for the US. Um, even if the Constitution is not flexible, and people will know much better than me, but the, the Republican and Democrat parties have st astonishingly changed their positions over the much longer arc, as well as the geography with which they're associated, right? The Democrat mm. party was very much a, a South party, not a, you know, it's like, so a lot of the pieces have moved around historically, and yet now we seem at this brink of this, you know, in, in, incredible polarization and rigidity. It'd be good to know what else you think that is gonna give um, maybe some of the other state-based um, dimensions on which things might move, or, or, or is the US kind of doomed? I don't know what you think, what's the way out? Um, with that rather depressing, overarching thought, just three other quick ones. One about today and, and why I think World Value Survey is so important. I mean, one is to, to be able to kind of sense of genuinely understand, you know, escape from our pluralistic ignorance. We kind of have this presumption other people often have similar views to us. The UK has had a pretty bad version of that and it's elite with respect to Brexit. But to actually understand, well, how similar are we in lots of ways? The surveys tend to, I was talking to Christian this morning, you know, we tend to look at the, the variables that are, are interesting because they're distinguished, and, you know, they, they, we look different on them. But actually we forget often there's this massive also volume of things on which we appear to have tacit agreement with each other. And we don't see it very well, not least because parties are busy not talking about that stuff, the similarity. Mm. And if World Value Survey gives us some kind of sense of it, it's really useful. The work we did a few years ago, you'll know, I think it's worth revisiting, is we just try to, if you didn't know the countries that people are in kind of thing, and you were in southern England, for example, where are you most similar to? Turns out your most similar country when we looked at it, on your values, everything we look at, was Germany, West Germany. It was like, oh my God. By the way, North England was most similar to East Germany. But it gives you some perspective on actually, well, who are we like and who are we not? And it might not be the same as our mental map. There's something that like the shortcuts we use about our identity, which we imagine, then become quite consequential. And they might fundamentally, empirically, in everyday life be quite wrong. And the World Value Survey, I think, gives us some correcting perspective, not just at an elite level, but for all of us in our lives. Um, if I might look to some of Pippa's other work, which I think is fantastic, one of the things is also interesting, um, your work, Pippa, on um, skeptical trust, um, I think is really interesting. And to try and use this to bring together different kind of variables, for those of who spend more of our lives in government, um, trying to unpack the kind of production function of what effective government and legitimate government looks like, not least with respect to quite big battles between potentially authoritarian and democratic positions. Um, we did a report years ago, actually, when I worked for Tony Blair, on legitimacy and trust in public institutions, which is trying, well, what, you know, in square brackets for Tony, why aren't they all more grateful, the bastards, you know? Um, but what drives it, and of course a lot of it was, is, I mean, Pippa's unpacked it in much more detail since about, well, actually, are you delivering and do the public, can they distinguish that or can they not? That, that hopefully there is some actual route between that, the performance of governments and societies. But to unpack it in more detail, really important, including the role of the media, which I know you've talked about in other work. You know, like you've got, a, either you could be in Norway or somewhere and do a really good job and you've got a kind of effective media and that will be discerned, or actually you control the media. Um, to put it in crass terms, and is a viable and scary prospect. The last thing about World Value Survey, which I think is so important, um, and this work in general, is it, I mean, not just pulls it back on a kind of in a simple way about, well, who's like us or who's different, but it's also giving us clues about the kind of, the deep structure of society about the patterns of influence. So when we're trying to answer a question about, well, to what extent our country's getting similar or different, you know, or regions or within countries or not, it's also telling us presumably something about our patterns of influence. So I have in mind sort of Festinger's classic study, if you can remember 1951, where he, he looks at rumors. They release deliberate rumors into married student housing and see which spreads. 
and it's like a way of, you know, obviously a long time before social media, you could then see the social networks. So they go back and survey people. It turns out that the houses, for example, at the end of the close that face out the other way don't pick up on the rumours, whereas within each close you get convergence, flips one way or the other about their position on this issue and their knowledge of it. So it's kind of doing it on its almost geopolitical level. It's helping us, it's dropping in the sort of iodine or whatever to see social networks and patterns of influence, which themselves are really important if you think, you know, social capital, et cetera, matters. Um, but I guess the last thing to kind of bring it back to Pippa's stuff is, um, and, I, and Christian mentioned this a bit, certainly a side conversation this morning, is what are the other institutions that are part then of that story that explain the gap between, you know, the high level, you know, do we trust our institutions, et cetera, and this sort of social fabric. There's lots of other things in that gap, social media, other kinds of media, other kinds of patterning. Um, can we layer that in to complete our account in a, in a useful way? Brilliant. Thank you so much, David. So I'm going to come back to you, Pippa, just to reflect on anything that you, you'd like from that collection while we, while I scan the room for questions for people because we've got microphones uh, spread around. But Pippa, back to you first. So a really sort of comments, and really uh, such a pleasure to be with you all. Um, so Paula, I mean, I know you'll use these schematics as well in your own work when you've looked at Labour and Conservative and other voters, and it's absolutely right that what we need to do is bring together and synthesise the work of the party system scholars who look at institutions, the work of the electorate and how the public and voters are responding to that, and then uh, the, the links to the two. So that goes right back to the classic work on representation, right? And how far the parties um, understand where the voters are, how far the voters understand where the parties are, and why there's a mismatch, which there often is. Um, and I did some work with Johnny Long Dusty years and years ago on that mismatch, which um, I still think we need to understand further. Negative partisanship is a fascinating development. It's basically hatred of the other versus love of your own. And I think the two things aren't too much of a puzzle in the sense that Positive partisanship, i.e., the IP of Labour or Conservative or Democrat or Republican, we can talk plenty of the alignment. And so, what else is going to prompt you to vote? And so, and parties have learnt, and the media have learnt, and voters have learnt that it's easier to be anti versus positive, particularly in countries and systems like the United States where negative ads or negative campaigns and where you're trying to segment your voters and just appeal to your base can be done. It's much more difficult if you had to appeal through either, for example, media which don't allow negative coverage, or which you have to appeal to a national audience which reaches all sectors, or if you have parties which are competing across the whole country. So I think there are some structural factors which mediate in that relationship between party systems and the electorate and where they, where they place themselves. But I very much agree with all your points. Um, and a politics is messy, and we do need to understand very much the divisions of polarisation within parties, because after all, that is how the Republican Party has changed. I mean, in the McCain days, and in the days where we had a whole bunch of moderates, we could see, if you look in the 1950s, that vote view is excellent on this. Many, many of the senators, many of the House members were in the middle, and they were the swing votes. They were the Joe Manchins of the world, and of course that has faded, including Joe Manchin, who's standing down. And so the number of inde real independents, like Lisa McCuskey in Alaska, um, is really faded away. And that means you don't have either the social bonds in the Senate to bargain and compromise that were there in the Kennedy days, nor do you have a ways to really even talk to your opponents, because all you're doing is talking to your base. And when you only talk to your base, and your base is narrow, and you can get elected because of primaries, and because of ways in which um, so many districts are, are skewed towards your majority, you don't need to appeal beyond that group to get elected, but you need to really think how you actually work as a system, as a legislature, as a parliament, where the party is divided. Um, just a quick anecdote on that. You know they've just passed the budget, right? And so the Speaker of the House and the new Speaker of the House um, managed to do that. But of course, as a result, one member of, of Congress is challenging his ability to be Speaker. Well, you can't have a system that works like that. A party can't work like that. Policies can't work like that. Government can't work like that. If, a, uh, if a, uh, the authority of the party, i.e. the speaker, the leader of the party, could be pulled down by one member of, of Congress. So um, intra and inter-party politics, and of course, the divisions in the Tory party and in the past in the Labour party are always fascinating as well to understand. <laughs> um, so 
that's really important. And David, uh, really good points. And thank you for your plan for my own book. That's always helpful. <laughs> Embrace it in skepticism. Thank you. Good point. So I've got one of the first question I saw was out here. Uh, and then. Hi, Ed. Thanks. Really interesting panel. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the actual electoral system itself and how that builds into this, like the electoral college in the USA, meaning independent parties. It, it means if you've got proportional representation, people don't tactically vote. Does tactical voting increase polarization? Does it reduce the number of parties in the system? So I, I wondered if there was any kind of thoughts on how whether we have first past the post, and we, we know the mayoral system was second preference and now it's first past the post. Does that make a difference? Does that feed into the number of parties there are, but also how polarizing ha polarization happens because it affects voter behavior, not just voters' feelings about the party. And negative partisanship, because a lot of people are gonna vote for Labour, not because they want to vote for Labour, because they yeah. hate the Conservatives. Thank you. I'll take, a, I'll take a couple, if that's okay. We'll take a little bit. Hi, Steve Schiffer. Is, uh, fascinating. Again, great work, Pippa, to hear that. And we all buy your book, I'm sure. Just wanted to bring up again a bit more detail what David was mentioning, the role of the media. Because one of the striking things to me, and I know you've done work on this, is that it's not just the polarization in terms of the parties and their positions, it's the polarization in terms of the media. And the, I think, you know, the Pew data shows, I mean, literally Republicans will not believe anything that CNN says and Democrats will not believe anything that Fox says. And these are, you know, the, all the major media providers are completely polarized. And that, uh, I mean, obviously it interacts both with the party system who wants to encourage it and it has some roots in the, you know, First Amendment rights that, that changed uh, the need for a balanced approach. But it seems that it, it, it's got to have some significance in either encouraging or producing the degree of polarization we're seeing in the US compared to some of the other systems. Oh, very good. So I'll come to you first, Pippa, and then anyone else can chip in. Um, so uh, the electoral system is vital, and, uh, and as Anna said, the real problem, of course, is if you get um, a plurality or majority system, which basically filters out the number of parties drastically, maybe just down to two, but then there's actual social cleavages and cultural cleavages within the electorate, because as Light Mark said, 1999, this is the worst possible, or one of the worst possible combinations. And the problem in America is, in Britain, you've gone through so many uh, electoral reforms in 1997 that you've actually got different ways of representing different groups, although it was at Westminster. In the United States, the debate is not about, in any sense, PR. It's not about a mixed member system, which I think would be the best, and the one which I would certainly advocate, as in 200 members of Congress, who will be elected through regional lists, etc. But it's all about ranked choice voting. And ranked choice voting is, is basically the same as the Australian system, preferential voting, and it's um, majoritarian, it's not proportional. So even though there are certain arguments and certain advocates, and it has a strong, um, it's, it's a strong reform movement right now for ranked choice voting in America, uh, I don't think it's the solution to the electoral reforms. And again, it's the constitutional rigidity which is the problem in America. The electoral college one aspect, but there are many, many other aspects, which means it's incredibly difficult to change these things across the country. And what happens is that the democratic states introduce all sorts of reforms, which are great. Independent electoral commissions, for example, to get rid of redistricting. And then the Republican Party has maps which are even more skewed, and it appoints more judges who are more conservative and go along with it. So we're ending up with two countries, essentially, or two systems, or it's like abortion rights are going to go right the way from Arizona, which recently, just, just yesterday, just more or less barring abortion for everybody, through Massachusetts, which is expanding access and giving everybody um, certain subsidies to get access and so on. So um, the, the, the institutions, unfortunately, and the party, party institutions in particular, which reinforce Democrats and Republican parties, are dividing America into two, and the divisions are getting worse and worse. And you've got no release, you've got no way to accommodate it, because no independent candidate, um, there was an attempt to get a, a, a party called No Labels. In fact, it was not a real No, no Labels party. But even if it was, even if it was a genuine moderate party, they wouldn't get elected by any shape or form. They just get defeated, defeated, defeated in every race, because you can't get a plurality um, because of the structural biases against you as a third party 
candidate, basically. So um, it's, the, it's the lack of match between the electoral system and the social cleavages, which, as Lightbulb said, is really problematic. Media, yes, media polarization, or what I term segmentation, and in particular, media bubbles and media filters um, are a, a large core cause of misinformation and a sense that, again, you have two realities in the matter. And if you're in one and you watch books, you believe the economy is dreadful, you are know, tanking, and inflation is getting far, far worse. And if you're in the red state of Massachusetts, in most areas, you believe Biden's done a great job in the economy, and inflation's come down, and unemployment is brilliant, and what's the problem? Um, and you have two senses of reality. Uh, Trump can continue to appeal to his, Biden can continue to appeal to his core vote. Um, and media fragment of requirements. Uh, but also commercial pressures. And that's also affected, of course, the United Kingdom. But even in the United Kingdom, you have major, channel, major channels with major audiences. Um, if you look at the share, of the share of viewers, for example, of the BBC and ITV, it's still very large, especially on national events or on political events or in election coverage. In America, everybody, not just on social media, but in legacy media, only goes to their own channels and they get reinforcement. And that means you never listen to the other side at all. You don't even learn about it. Bobby, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Pippa. So we're nearly out of time. I'm just going to scan the room and see if there's any... Oh, yes, there is. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, down on this side, any, any other final takers? Or this will be our last question. Great. Final. Hi, Pippa. It's Rosie Campbell Kings here. Um, I'm looking for a grain of hope from you at the end of the session because you've talked about... We all know wherever you live in the world that what happens in the US is going to affect all of us. Um, and you've talked about the systems blockages that mean there cannot be, it's very difficult for a correction to occur. Um, but I was wondering, are there any glimmers of hope? You've talked about how religion and religiosity is part of the source of polarization. And I can see some of the trends you know, that, that would continue to feed that. But do you see any counter pressures, anything happening in society that might drive the Republicans in the other direction in the longer term? So that's the big question. That's the thousand, you know, one dollar question. Um, I might sound depressed and I might sound um, negative, but really I can see this as realistic. Essentially, what we're doing is we're facing a tight election. I looked at the polls yesterday and the most recent ones, of course, it's a year away, but nevertheless, you know, it's kind of neck and neck, and Trump is still ahead in some of the um, uh, swing states. We know that Biden has certain strengths, but again, some of those are being eroded. Young people, for example, um, uh, Paula will have, may have looked at those figures. They're no longer so keen. Uh, even black Americans and Hispanics, who are socially conservative, are not necessarily supporting the Democrats in the way they were. Uh, and, and so there's an enthusiasm gap, and Trump can continue to appeal to his base. And it's getting worse in his rhetoric. Uh, if you've been reading any of his recent speeches, the use of um, the word bloodbath and violence and threats and the things which he says he's going to do to his opponents. Um, the court case is going to exacerbate that, of course. And of course, they've been delayed. So they're going to happen later and later in the electoral cycle and become more and more partisan in the interpretation of them as well. Uh, so all of that's, that's going on. And, and so, I mean, one has to be depressed because there's so little. Two years ago, I'd have said, well, look, we'll have other candidates. There's a lot of good talent in the Democratic Party. There's lots of younger, up and coming polit politicians who are leaders at governor level, um, uh, certain ministers, uh, Pete Buttigieg, for example. Um, uh, think about California. Think about some other states where there have been some successes. But now we've gone through the primary process and nothing's changed. And the age factor continues, and Trump continues. And it's like an uh, American nightmare. We are living through what we've lived through in the past, and we see things getting worse, not better. Plus the fact that if uh, Trump did get elected, then there's not even the constraints of a second term, right? And we know from the past, whenever I've looked at the trends in other countries where you have authoritarian populist leaders who've come to power, the first term isn't the worst. The first term is where they're learning the ropes. The first term is where they have some constraints if they want to get re-elected. The second term is when they know much more how to manipulate the system and where they, they, they have certain pressure points where they're going to press, whether it's on corruption, nepotism, 
whether it's on um, uh, uh, limiting rights. Um, so uh, I can't feel, I, I know you want Rosie some hope. Um, I'm struggling, I'm afraid. Um, you know, I, I mean, nothing is nothing set in stone. It's a long time till November. Uh, Trump may, the indictment may happen. Mm. You know, the court cases, but you know, I've also heard this may, 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 uh, ever since like uh, 2016, and every every time Trump seems to get through, um, and it's a real problem, by the way, writing objective, good, solid, reliable political science when you've got this kind of cloud hanging over you in American democracy. Um, if any of the panel have anything, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I know you want to go sing a song as you leave, right? Um, yeah, we're going for drink sing because I think we need it uh, <laughs> after <laughs> that. That was a bit absolutely realistic and a really vital for us to realise the, the challenges there. I just want to turn to the panel see if there's any comments on that before we finish up. Anything anyone wants to add? Yeah, cool. yeah David. Any? I'd say a couple of things quickly. I mean, firstly, on the electoral system point, they are crucial but in unpredictable ways. I mean, we went from the end of our two-party system to the biggest vote share since 1970 for the two parties. So it, vo voter volatility is something we haven't spoken about enough because it's huge. And actually, also in the US, a third-party candidate might be crucial this year despite the electoral system. And one final thing I'd say is if you're interested in polarization, negative partisanship, and the role of social media, you should watch the bleeding Indian election because that's going to be horrible. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, really important point. David O'Connor? Yeah, I was going to um, come in partly on the point, I should say, um, I'm a policy wonk, so I sort of feel like the sensible things you could do in the middle, but one of the puzzles always, I think, on both sides of the Atlantic has been why, and if you, if you looked at Pippa's plots, you see this, given that where the Democrats are, or normally the sort of this, the centre-left, is that why, when in power, don't you see more of those, um, be it in the US, um, for example, if you had compulsory voting Australia style, or if you made other kinds of change. Um, and similarly in the UK, if you move for a PR system, most people conclude you'd end up with a centre sort of anchoring, which was a more centrist system. Um, and that the, that is an interesting puzzle as to why centre-left administrations haven't said, we should, we should take the bit of pain for that and make that change, because it would anchor the system in a fundamental way. Um, the other thing which we haven't talked about, apart from the really interesting phenomenon of these more floating voters, maybe it's a good thing, and we should also remember one of the lessons from the work, from World Valley Survey, is most of the world is not America. Like, it's really important yeah. that, despite the brilliant scholars like um, Pepper and others, partly because of the, the strength of, I think, US academia, it probably projects even more strongly. So it's, the corrective is a really useful one, which is mm -hmm. that European democracies don't seem to be going the same route. But... Um, but there might be other innovations as well. So if you think, I think one of the incredibly interesting books of the last decade, right, of this sort of why nations fail or narrow corridor type work, um, and in particular this idea of the shackled leviathan, of which democracies are this genius to achieve. How do we, we, how do we imbue more power in a government but simultaneously constrain its power? Um, and that's basically right what effective democracies and sets of institutions do. And so there's an interesting question. Well, what, I mean, we look at the US and say it's a bit stuck, but most countries are a bit stuck. What's the next iterations? So we've always been really interested in, in my team, partly because we look at behavioral issues which affect human, you know, everybody's life day and day out, is to up our game on democratic innovation. So the Irish model, I think, is a really interesting one, that you can have between elections genuinely sophisticated mechanisms which take random samples, does that sound familiar? Have proper deliberations which are not just your reaction you know, in a poll, but on reflection, and that you can um, show that you respect what they're doing sufficiently that they start accruing genuine legitimacy and power. And that looks like the next stage or a possible next stage in a sort of shackle of the because it's going to anchor you. If you think about where does that take you to, if you've got reasonable discussion because a bunch of people have to sit there for a couple of days and really think their way through an issue, it moves you inherently away from the polarization normally into consensus positions of some kinds. So I think beyond the kind of set piece, very high level reforms, it's worth the thinking about not least going back to that resonance deeply in the W World Value Survey about how we learn and influence from each yeah. other, is well, what, what do we take from that for institutional design that could be re-injected back, at least not for us to decide, but in some ways to be given back as a choice to society? Like what, right. what, what mechanism would you like? Yeah, really important. Um, <laughs> Yeah, please. Very, very quick, yes. 
Uh, I'm checking the, the Bible right now. The Congress is debating the Insurrection, Insurrection Act in America, which would uh, basically limit the power of the president to use domestic, uh, um, uh, 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 military force on domestic soil. So, I mean, <laughs> that's the stage that we're at. The worry is that if Trump did get in, um, there would be the deployment of the military in, in, in states. So I don't think deliberative participation and all the rest is going to stop uh, an authoritarian leader. Um, I think we need to think of it framing less in terms of um, the nice European democracies like Ireland, but more in terms of Latin America. And that's the model that we need to consider. It, it is more along those in, in unstable lines where populism and authoritarianism has a historically long lead. Yeah, we're just giving up on you for a second, Pippa. See if we can save our own democracy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. Say what you, also, of course, you're going to get an election in which the centre-left party comes back. Yeah. And so some of the bitterness of the Brexit era, of course, as the panel knows the best than I do, mm. is failing. So there is hope in cool. Britain. <laughs> I, was, I was just waiting for a line we could finish on, and that, that is it. That's there the is hope. perfect line. Thank you so much, Pippa. There is hope in Britain. Thank will you, we, thank no, thank, thank you, you so much. We will let you go, Pippa. Thank you very much. And uh, another round of applause to thank you for uh, thanks for our amazing panel for you've done this for us today. You can just stay there for a second. That's I am just going to. This is like just one or two slides. Is that right? Yeah. So it, uh, we are finished. That is uh, the end of an incredible day. Uh, all I've got to do really is to give a few thanks. I mean, first, of course, to all of you for attending for submitting papers, for chairing sessions that really did make the day incredibly rich uh, for all of us. To the team at, at King's who put all this together, a huge amount of work gone into this, uh, and they've done it so well. And uh, big thanks to our student ambassadors who've been helping us all day find our way around in, in lots and lots of other ways. Uh, and then to our project partners at UCL, Behavioural Insights Team and Social Change Initiative, and our funders, particularly Economic and Social Research Council, ESRC, but across the funders that we've got, all these groups of people that made uh, this happen, which was uh, incredible effort from all of them. So just very quickly um, on next steps, from our perspective, the upcoming focus for us, as we, we said at the beginning, is this policy lab policy engagement on polarisation in the UK and what that means for institutional confidence. So today's session has been incredibly useful for that. Uh, and then we will be moving on to a kind of special case of that in terms of cohesion or uh, splitting apart in values between UK nations. So if you've got interest in those, do stay in touch. And then we'll be doing uh, various journal articles on generational attitudes. You saw some of it in some of the sessions uh, today. And then more technical things on the mode effects of random probability and online sample data, which um, for those who are interested in that, do stay in touch on that. And then a couple of things. Great thing about the World Value Survey is it has led to, this particular study has led to lots of spin-off studies funded by others. Uh, so we're looking at the role of values in international decision making, which is a really interesting thing, building on lots of great work from Mario and uh, uh, people at European Commission about how do you actually use this type of insight in decision making which is great. And then something on there, a study on the lived experience of polarisation in the UK using more ethnographic and qualitative methods about how does it actually feel uh, in those polarised positions. So do stay in touch. You can follow us on the website, on the social media channels. Uh, we'd love to hear your views, love to think about things that we can do together. We will be in touch via email, usual kind of feedback things. What I would, what we would like to do as part of that is just to get a sense of you of, of what are the one or two things that you've really taken from this, the, the individual facts, surprising facts, or new insights that you've taken from it, because uh, we do want to share that more widely. Things that have surprised or interested you will likely have interested other people, so that would be a great thing to do too. So that is it, apart from drinks. Um, so we have drinks, and there is sunshine, just about. There is a bit of sunshine, so if we move quickly to the south side, so grab, <laughs> grab this sunshine while it lasts. Uh, see you on the other side, uh, and on the terrace, hopefully. Thank you all.